Uh, thank you, Luis, for, for having us here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here and the other uh, organizers working on, on creating this very long lasting event. It, it has been like four days, if I am not mistaken. And I am, I am really happy to, to be here. So, um, and before I start, I, I have to apologize. I really don't like the slides. I was trying this new platform and I didn't like the result and I'm so sorry, they are gonna be not good looking. Um, that said, what I'm gonna be talking today is very related to Jonas talk and maybe also to Otavio's one. And the title is a methodological shift in favor of some for a consistency in the sciences. And the question that I will address is how should we study and explain cases of inconsistent science without making the same methodological mistakes that have been made before? In the, in the following slides, I, I will try to explain which are the methodological mistakes that I am focusing uh, on. And, um, and what I will try to sketch is first uh, some guidance for doing a methodological change, and then to explain which type of entities, formal entities, could do this job, could help us to explain and model uh, scientific inconsistent reasoning without having these methodological gaps or problems. And I will say that uh, we will be able to get to this at least by using pre-consistent, something that I call the pre-consistent alternative approach. Um, and that will be. So the plan for the talk is first I will try to explain what is at stake when we are talking about applicability of logics and which type of results are we looking forward as philosophers of logic and also philosophers of science. Um, then I will explain which are the problems that we have when aiming at getting these results. And I will explain how I suggest to avoid these problems. Later on, I will also address which are going to be the consistent uh, reasoning strategies or what I call the pre-consistent alternative approach. And then uh, I will present some final remarks. So first, some preliminaries. Well, let the contradiction to be very broadly a pair of propositions where one is the negation of the other. Principle of explosion, as you all know, it suggests that any explosive theory will trivialize if it contains at least one contradiction. And a trivial theory is a theory in which it is possible to derive any proposition from it. Anything will be a theory in, in, within the theory. Uh, a pre-consistent logic is, can be characterized in the following way. So a logical consequence relation is pre-consistent if it is non-explosive. This is if it, it does not validate principle of explosion. And a formal theory is pre-consistent if despite of containing a contradiction, it is not trivial. Inconsistency toleration, very broadly, is uh, the ability of working with inconsistent information and avoiding triviality at the same time. We can recognize at least two instances of um, inconsistency toleration, a very abstract one when we say we have a theory that is inconsistent and is not trivial. Then we say there is a mechanism that allows us to tolerate the contradiction. So it's inconsistency tolerant, the theory, in, in an abstract sense. But we also say that when scientists or regular people are reasoning from inconsistent information without arriving at anything as a conclusion, without reaching logic, what we expect to be logical triviality in these cases. So um, we can recognize at least two, these two different instances of what is inconsistency toleration. And so uh, the first question that we might have is, all this consider what is at stake when we are trying to see if science is inconsistent, or if we have uh, scientific theories that might be inconsistency tolerant, or if scientists uh, sometimes follow inconsistency tolerant uh, re uh, inference patterns or things like that. So what is at stake? And in order to, to respond this, to this question from a philosopher of logic perspective, I would advise you to adopt an anti-exceptionalist view about logic. What does this mean? Well, there is this old debate as, as Jonas was referring to it, that comes from Quine about what is the connection of logic and with sciences, especially with empirical sciences. Is logic a science that will have a methodology similar to the ones that we see in the empirical sciences? 
the epistemic practices, are they similar? Are they very different? So there are two, two main standpoints in this debate. Uh, exceptionalists will claim that the truths and the methodology of logic are significantly different from the ones that other, of other scientific disciplines, especially the ones uh, that we call empirical sciences, making the study of logic an enterprise of a unique kind. So which are the goods that we consider when we say the methodology of logic? Uh, they could be things such as what we consider to be evidence and which is the effect that evidence has in something like theory choice. So it might have, evidence might play uh, a significant role in the empirical sciences when choosing a theory over another, but maybe not in logic. Maybe the characterization of evidence will be very different from one area to the other. And also what we call it, for instance, what we call uh, explanations might vary from what they are in the empirical sciences to what they could be in logic and so on and so forth. So that, that is what is at stake. And in contrast, the anti-exceptionalist will claim that logic is continuous with other sciences, in particular with empirical sciences. So it's not clear in which, uh, in which senses it could be continuous. It could be continuous at the epistemic level. The goods that we get are going to be the same ones or the goods that we aim at uh, will be the same ones, for instance, explanation, prediction, and so on. Um, or it could be the same in the sense of methodology. We could be looking for things such as evidence in favor of our theories in order to uh, go through theory choice processes and so on. So uh, for an anti-exceptionalist, there is going to be a close relation between the methodological criteria for evaluating and determining the success of a scientific theory and the methodological criteria for the same purposes, but concerning logical theories given any theory in any science, metaphysics, ethics, logic, or anything else, we choose the theory which is best, best meets uh, those criteria which determine a good theory. Principle among this is adequacy to the data for which the theory is meant to account, um, among others. But those are particular inferences that strike us as correct or incorrect. So, uh, adequacy to the data is only one criterion. However, uh, others that are frequently invoked are simplicity, non ad hocness, unifying power, fruitfulness, among others. So this is uh, coming from Priest, which is a very clear anti-exceptionalist about logic, but uh, about non-classical logic, for instance. And so what, what this quote from Graham suggests is that applicability plays an important role. So we want to see that a theory that is designed to account for a certain domain, when, put, when being put over that domain, it works well. It satisfies our goals uh, and the expectations that we had about its application in that domain. So, and that relates to what applicability does in empirical sciences. In empirical sciences, the effective application of a particular theory within a specific domain is considered to be indicative of the partial success of the theory in question. For a theory to be satisfactorily applied within a domain, it has to have a previous important degree of adequacy to the data about that domain. Um, and so I sent to the reference of Otavio's paper on empirical adequacy and the role that empirical adequacy plays in the empirical sciences for, for instance, acceptance of, for theory acceptance and so on. So when a theory is satisfactorily applied with, within a domain, the specific characteristics of this domain would constrain, limit, and inform the inference patterns that hold within the theory, and in that particular case, uh, preventing an inferential type of adoptness. So in this sense, um, applicability will help us to satisfy some of these other criteria that, that we were considering to be um, indicative of the success of a theory. So we will have uh, a type of non adoptness uh, through the applicability of the theory. And also uh, we, will, we will see some kind of fretfulness. Once we see that a theory is well applied in a particular domain, we can start thinking about how to extend its applicability to, to other similar domains, for instance. Um, 
And so similarly, the applicability uh, of a theory blocks an interpretative tie of a darkness. So it's not only going to be an inferential uh, kind of a darkness, but also an interpretative one. And it grounds the ways in which the content of the theory can be interpreted in that particular case or in that particular domain. Finally, applicability often broads the descriptive and explanatory scope of the theories, facilitating the resolution of relevant problems in the domain of application, preserving and increasing the fruitfulness in the of the theory in question. In this sense, uh, we can start seeing that applicability is the, in a sense, the union of, of all these criteria. So once they are satisfied in a, in a significant way, we can say that uh, if there is a domain and the theory is applied, we are safe to say that it is successful, at least in that sense. And at least for the anti-exceptionalists, the epistemic benefits linked to applicability are not going to be restricted to the empirical disciplines, but can be extended to the logical realm. That, um, that is obvious from, from the main um, statement of the anti-exceptionalist. And as a matter of fact, large part of philosophical debates about logic relies on our capability of identifying successful applications of certain theories and assessing their philosophical import. When a logical theory is applied to a novel domain, this is taken to be evidence of its strength as legitimacy. And where can we see the cases of this? Uh, very basically in the debates about logical pluralism versus logical monism. The many examples that we can get from, from these discussions include ways in which certain logics that are uh, different logics can be applied satisfactorily in different domains in, in favor of the pluralist view, for instance. And in case of the uh, monist view, sometimes people just provide the same logic applied in different domains. And so in that sense, it seems that, um, that there is a, a very clear anti-exceptionalist view in the methodology that these people are following. Not only the people that are discussing if uh, logic is uh, extensive or continuous with science, but also people that are using logics and applications to defend a certain point, such as the ones uh, joining the logical pluralism and logical monism debate. And so it is natural to think that logical theories are justified in part uh, by the available evidence for most scientific theories, the observational data forms the bulk of the evidence. The evidence for a logical theory can come from a number of sources, from intuitions about validity or analytic modality, from mathematical theories and practice, from psychology of reasoning, from epistemic norms and rationality, and so on. And so when, when we look at, uh, at claims like this one, the impression that we get is that the evidence that uh, philosophers of logic and logicians are looking for is in a sense evidence coming from applications of our logics. If one can identify a good domain that uh, it's really well explained thanks to our, par uh, our particular logic, then we say that it comes as a, this application comes as uh, evidence in favor of the legitimacy or the, the strength of this logic. And also if it fails to be applied in any other domain, then we start being skeptical about how much this logic is really a logic and not only an algebra, for instance. So, um, and as I was saying, when logicians seek for domains of application for the logical theories and expect the applicability of their theories to be informative about their legitimacy and to play a role in the process of theory choice in case of logics, what they are being committed to is to methodological criterion according to which evidence plays a privileged role in justifying a rational commitments toward specific theories, regardless of these theories being scientific or logical. Um, and so the, the basic idea is that when we are trying to see if a, a theory, a logical theory holds in a particular domain, uh, we are seeking for testing up the applicability of that theory because we believe that this applicability will be revealing about the success and the legitimacy of the theory. And so this is not a point that uh, only people, as I was saying, in, in this particular debate about anti-exceptionalism and exceptionalism about logic will, will hold, but it's something that we see in many of the philosophical debates about logical consequence relations. <laughs> 
And so uh, that's the reason why I would like to, to endorse an anti-exceptionalist standpoint for, for the following parts of the talk. Because I think the only way in which we can make sense of how important applications of logic are and how revealing they are about uh, our philosophical commitments, it's by taking this as a methodological stance to consider that uh, logic at the methodological level at least is, uh, is continuous with the empirical sciences. Maybe we don't seek uh, the exact type of empirical evidence that we do in physics, but we are looking forward to find good applications of our logics in order to defend that they are good logics, they are successful, or they are equally good than other ones in a, in a different domain or in the same domain. So um, that, that is why uh, I would assume this standpoint for, for the following. So why should we look at science when we are having a debate about how much logic or which logics are needed in the science? In, in, in applications. Uh, why should we ask if there, is a, there are applications or significant applications of certain logics in the scientific realm? And the reason is um, because we usually see that there, there is a, like a trend in, in philosophy of logic that assumes that there should be a close relation between what logic is and what reasoning is. And also we have a, another more or less commonly shared agreement uh, among philosophers of science and epistemologists of science about how privileged scientific knowledge is. How the standards of evidence, the standards of justification and so on are stronger in science than they are in, for instance, our daily life. So if we get something epistemically relevant about reasoning, for instance, in the sciences, that will be relevant also for describing and explaining what happens in our daily life. And when in our daily life we fail at getting, for instance, good results or good inferences, then uh, what we have understood from reasoning the sciences might be explanatory of why we are failing. So that, that is what has made uh, the relation between science and logic as reasoning so important in philosophical discussions. And for the particular case of inconsistency toleration in, uh, in science and the use of paraconsistent logic, uh, this special area has been even more revealing. Because allegedly, we, if we concede that uh, scientific knowledge and scientific reasoning is so sophisticated that it might be the best instance of human reasoning, and we find contradictions and we find uh, inconsistency tolerant mechanisms within scientific reasoning, that should be revealing about how we can deal with contradictions rationally in, uh, in other contexts. And historians, historians of science and philosophers of science have claimed that we have many instances of inconsist satisfactorily inconsistency toleration uh, processes in the sciences. We have, as I said, inconsistency toleration at the level of theories or models that in abstract they are inconsistency tolerant and you can move inconsistent information from one part to another and still not reach logical triviality. And we also have epistemic practices in the, in the shape of inferential maneuvers that seem to be inconsistency tolerant and still preserve rationality. Uh, some of the most famous examples that we have of inconsistency toleration in the sciences include uh, Aristotle's theory of motion, the early calculus, Bohr theory of the atom and classical electrodynamics. Many of these examples are going to be uh, very abstract. Maybe uh, the Bohr's theory of the atom and the early calculus refer more to a type of uh, inferential processes, but classical electrodynamics, for instance, is an example that illustrates how a theory can be inconsistency tolerant, even if scientists never work with, uh, with the contradiction in actual practice. And so, uh, what has been happening once we see all these examples that seem to be very, very varied and, and very diverse? Uh, well, logicians have claimed that these examples illustrate that we can get some pretty consistent reasoning 
in the sciences. And then human reasoning might be in some context bigger paraconsistent. And some paraconsistent logics might be able to describe how we can work with inconsistent information without uh, being irrational, for instance. So according to uh, people like Michael, paraconsistent logicians have provided bias abductive argument to interpret the relation between what the historical records have shown and the success of paraconsistent logic. The idea uh, here would be that there are interesting and productive inconsistent theories from which people do not infer random and unconnected conclusions. Uh, so it might be thought the logic they use does not license such inferences. So this suggests that this way of going might be problematic. Going from these examples that we have uh, to, to say that there is certain type of paraconsistency underlying scientific reasoning, for instance, uh, might be problematic for some people. But why? Uh, take the, the quote from Graham, for instance. Hence, Bohr's account of the behavior of the atom was inconsistent. Yet, patently, uh, not everything concerning the behavior of electrons was inferred from it. This is not triviality was rich. Nor should it have been. Hence, whatever inference mechanisms that was, uh, it was that underlied uh, this must have been very consistent. And the basic idea is that uh, when logicians tend to find cases of inconsistent science, according to Michael, what they do is to go from the contradiction to try to explain it abductively. Why can we have this contradiction and not have triviality? Oh, the, better, the best explanation is that the logic must have been very consistent. And then the only task that logicians have to do after this is to go and test certain logics, paraconsistent logics, and explains which, which of them is better suited for explaining this particular case. However, this abduction, uh, abduction leap seems to be fallacious, at least in a methodological sense. Why? Because it assumes two, uh, two methodologically problematic statements. First, the presupposition of a logical closure. This is that rationality, or at least uh, parts of human rationality, should be uh, um, close under a particular logical consequence relation. And then uh, the second thing that they assume is that this logical consequence relation should be either uh, explosive or non-explosive. And so if we assume that it should be explosive, uh, People should infer everything. So it builds in a normative aspect. It assumes that not only we, uh, we have logical consequence relations uh, closing our chunks of reasoning, but also um, that we have to entail certain things or we are expected to entail certain things. And if not, then we can infer directly something about the logical consequence relation that is closing that part of a reason. So the first uh, question which needs to be raised concerns the status of should in the claim uh, about whether they should have inferred random sentences from the theory. And, and this has been addressed before, not, not only in the debate about paraconsistent reasoning, but it has been addressed by people like Harman and as a philosophical issue about logic as reasoning. So we have enough evidence to say that it's not so clear that uh, human rationality should be closed under any type of logical consequence relation. Um, and also it's not clear that uh, our idea of what a logical consequence relation is and which should be uh, the consequences of it must be extended to empirical, uh, empirical situations, such as actual human reason. So um, this normative claim about going from logic to human reasoning seems very fallacious. And this abductive inference seems to be unjustified for two different reasons. First, as I was saying, it relies heavily on the empirical evidence that is never provided. So these logicians that are saying that, um, that from these cases of inconsistency toleration, we should infer uh, that scientists were reasoning with certain logic, paraconsistent logic, uh, 
must have provided before claiming something like that, that there is a logical closure of evidence in favor of the existence of a particular logical closure uh, in human cognition. And they are not appealing to anything like that. And second, uh, the second problem that one can see in this abductive leap is that um, it assumes that all cases of tolerance of contradictions are at least structurally uniform. So that is the reason why uh, it doesn't really matter which is the particular case, but people like Graham Priest can infer that uh, as it is, the reasoning is not trivial, the consequence relation that is close in this chunk of information, this chunk of reasoning, must have been very consistent. And, and so what, what ends happening is that it ignores the historical particularities or the uh, context particularities of the reasoning that is being carried out in these contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, the explanation of the mechanisms that allow such tolerance in one specific case would be the same for any other case, as we can see, especially in a standpoint such as uh, the Christian one. So, what would I suggest to do? Uh, as these seem to be methodological problems on the assumptions that uh, logicians have to infer and interpret the specific cases of inconsistent toleration in the sciences, I would suggest you do a methodological shift. So if there is a modification to do, it has to be at the methodological level. And to do so, let me say very briefly what is uh, in the table, which are our options. So logicians and philosophers have developed three different types of research programs for the study of inconsistency in science. Historical programs, which um, consist only on reconstructing the historical episode that seems to have been uh, revealing of inconsistency toleration. So for the case of, for instance, the early calculus, what we do is just to go through the historical evidence that we have about uh, Newton working with the calculus, what Newton have not only written like officially, but what, which testimonies we can find about what Newton thought about infinitesimal entities and whether if he thought that they were inconsistent or not. And uh, we look at every historical detail and then we provide a reconstruction of that. But we shouldn't be doing more philosophical work there. So it's just providing like the landscape historically. And that's the historical progress, are strictly committed to historical, historical accuracy. Uh, on the other hand, we have the logical programs, which are generally characterized as uh, just trying to explain which are the inferential mechanisms that could have taken place in these particular cases. And at this point, because of that could have taken place, uh, we can see a, a very clear difference between the historical and the logical programs. Well, the historical programs are trying to say what exactly happened. The logical programs are trying to explain what might have happened. And so the historical accuracy over there is mostly lost in many cases, in the large majority of cases. And then we have the methodological programs, which are more um, like reflective on these two results, on, on this, on the results of these two accounts. So methodological programs are just going to focus on saying things such as which, which was the role that, for instance, consistency or contradictions played for theory acceptance or theory choice or uh, the rejection of a particular theory. What normative things can we conclude from looking at the historical record or what normative things can we say about uh, the scientific enterprise in general? And, but because, because these programs often are disconnected and we see historians providing reconstructions of the cases, but we also see logicians providing reconstructions of the cases without looking at the historical record. Some people like uh, Kevin Davey or Peter Vickers have claimed that, uh, that the results of, of especially the logical programs that do not focus on historical accuracy must be rejected or must be weakened. Our commitments towards them must be weakened. And so this has pushed us to consider that 
in order to account for scientific reasoning and explain when, under which circumstances, it can be inconsistency tolerant and under which circumstances it shouldn't be inconsistency tolerant, we and why, uh, we should provide an account that, in a sense, combines the historical, the logical, and the methodological progress. And this has become clear that any attempt to understand the phenomenon of inconsistency toleration must put these programs all together in some way. Okay, and so how to how can we do something like this? And maybe we can find a balance looking at both the uh, the historical record and the historical reconstructions that we get but also the philosophical explanations that we have, not only in terms of logic, but also the epistemological ones. And if we pay attention to that connection, we will see that the large majority of cases that we have, especially in the empirical sciences of inconsistency toleration, are going to show a close relation between ignorance and inconsistency toleration, and rational inconsistency toleration. And the reason is the following. Uh, in the empirical sciences, as, as Jonas was mentioning before, people tend to assume that contradictions might not be true. And, and we have no evidence to consider that they are true, actually. And so uh, when one finds a contradiction, usually what happens is that one looks for, uh, for a way to dismiss one of the parts of the contradiction or explains out why is it there as a result of the theory or uh, as an assumption that is working or as a consequence uh, of um, observational reports and so on. So what we assume is a contradiction shouldn't be true. And at least one of the parts of this thing that looks like a contradiction must be false. And why scientists don't dismiss it immediately? Because in the majority of cases, the lack of information that will help us to say which part of the contradiction is false. And all these explanations that provide this, that uh, embrace this spirit, what are suggesting is that inconsistency toleration only happens when we are ignorant of something. So the question is ignorant of what? And um, what, what seems to be happening is that apparently scientists ignore the truth value of certain propositions, the ones that are containing the contradiction. Even if they think that the contradiction is false, they ignore the components, uh, the truth values of the components of the contradictions, right? So they cannot assign whether uh, true or falsity to any of those. And this is what can be called factual ignorance in the sense of lacking knowledge of the athletic value of each of the propositions. So we find we are scientists, we find a contradiction, we discover that we lack of information for assigning a truth value to the components of the contradiction, and then we can see, oh, I have, I have two options. I can have a classical intuitions that will say this contradiction is false, or I would be uh, more inclined to say, oh, this contradiction can be true because I am a dialetheistic person or I have a dialetheistic spirit. But then in the empirical sciences, we cannot move forward with this dialetheistic intuition. We cannot move forward to accept the contradiction as it is because we have no evidence backing up this intuition or this, uh, this motivation. How do we know that? Uh, we can look at all the cases, which are very few that dialetheists have provided from the empirical sciences, and we will see that none of them are better explained by a dialetheistic theory than by a consistent alternative, for instance, or even a pre-consistent one that it's not dialetheistic. And so at this level, when we are ignorant, we shouldn't be assuming, and we are not justified to assume, that this contradiction could be true. So which are the options that we have? We have uh, the classical intuition options. And so we either provide a consistent alternative or we are motivated to tolerate it, the contradiction temporarily, but not to reject it. Because this factual ignorance, what is saying is you, can, you are not justified to say that both parts of the contradiction are false. In the same way that you are not justified to assume that they are both true. So uh, rejection is out of the, of the discussion. And then 
if we cannot provide a consistent alternative, then we have to tolerate the, the contradiction that we, we must, in order to do something like that, we must seek for uh, inference patterns that allow us to work with this contradiction or with this inconsistent information. And so when looking for these inference patterns, uh, this can be of at least two types, consistency preservation ones or inconsistency toleration. And then depending on the particular case in which we are working, and we can uh, say, okay, what, what seems to be happening is that people were consistently compartmentalizing uh, the information, or they have a type of information restriction strategy. But also we can identify certain cases in which for a consistent compartmentalization was what was doing the job. And maybe there, there can be certain cases in which, oh, now once we are tolerating the contradiction and now that we are scrutinizing really like the historical record or the evidence that we have, the aletheism is the option. And this, what this happened, what this makes happen uh, at the end is that the scientists partially overcome the ignorance that they had about the truth values, but also about the inference patterns that hold within, uh, within their theory that cause the problem. Now, they can interpret that contradiction not as problematic, but they can provide an explanation of why it is not problematic. This is what, uh, what I call the partial overcoming of ignorance of theoretical structure. So, uh, what is really important is that the motivation for the contradiction in absence of a consistent alternative is the only option that we have initially. And then the selection of, during the selection of inference patterns, we can either choose a consistency preservation uh, approach or we can move to inconsistency toleration. But only there we can say something uh, about uh, either paraconsistency, dialetheism, or uh, consistent alternatives. Uh, in, in a sense, consistent interpretations of the problem. So uh, what I suggest to do is to take into account how these philosophical explanations work in the literature and try to, to follow a similar path when explaining which are the logics or which are the formal uh, tools that will help us to explain certain cases of inconsistency toleration and under which circumstances they will be paraconsistent and under which circumstances they won't be, even if you are uh, temporarily tolerating a contradiction. So, um, huh. how can we achieve something like that? Well, there seem to be two, two different alternative ways uh, to do this. So the first one is considering the logical programs that we were talking about at the, um, at the middle of the talk, which, include uh, the results of some schools of paraconsistent logics that have persistently aimed at providing logics that are supposed to describe and norm actual human reasoning in inconsistent context. Uh, let's call this the paraconsistent logics approach, which is the most traditional version of it. And these are general formal tools that according to, to many, not focus on identifying or proposing alternative logics. Um, no, this, this is not. Uh, but lurk in the background of scientific reasoning. That's, that's the main problem. So it seems that when you follow something like uh, the logical programs, what you are doing is assuming that a particular logic will hold in certain domain, in, in certain case study, in certain uh, fragment of scientific reasoning. And you just try, you assume that, and from that you try to explain how it, it does the work. But which are the background assumptions from doing this? Or oh, the ones that we were uh, criticizing before, the ones that uh, generated the abductive leap. Because first you are assuming that you might have to entail everything unless there is a very consistent logical consequence relation in the background. And from that, then you say, okay, now my task is identifying which is the one. And this is allegedly, which is going to be the result of these logical programs. The seek of the correct or the adequate or the accurate uh, logical consequence relation that can describe or explain these particular cases. But methodologically, it seemed to be um, not very successful. 
So what what should we looking what should we uh, be looking for? And according to people like um, Rice and Brown and in a sense Graham Priest, we should be seeking for general formal tools that not focus on identifying or proposing alternative logics or specific logics, because this might lurk in the background of scientific reason, that might lurk in the background of scientific reason, but focus on a more directly observable feature of, of reasoning. For instance, how and where different premises are invoked in the course of arguments and uh, which type of evidence is used and which type of consequences is uh, are are gotten from that uh, set of information and so on. And when are scientists following certain strategies and when they are not. And this will require us to not be studying the logic, but studying the historical evidence and the uh, epistemological explanations that we get. And also some of the methodological consequences that uh, people have suggested we can get from inconsistent storage in the sciences. So which are these going to be these things? According to Brown and Priest, this, these alternative uh, logical programs are going to be the ones that they call um, for a consistent reason in the strategies. And accordingly to them, this view, the general philosophical view behind uh, pre-consistent reason and strategies makes no assumptions about which is the underlying logic of scientific reasoning. It considers to be minimal, it is considered to be minimal when used to model specific cases of the history of science. So accordingly to them, what they are doing is, uh, you can say that they assume that there is a certain type of ignorance behind, but they start from this selection of inference patterns and a tolerate a tolerant attitude towards the contradiction. So they have a tolerant attitude towards the contradiction, and then they move to see which are the, the inference patterns that will hold better in these particular cases. And from that, they might get that uh, the reasoning that is that can be described uh, it was pretty consistent. Or they can say, oh no, the scientists found a way to preserve consistency in a very clear way. And they do not endorse dialectic commitments. They uh, do not endorse a significant paraconsistent commitment. And they, and they actually are classical supporters, something like that. So, uh, but the basic idea behind the paraconsistent reason strategies is, or the alternative logical programs, is that while they might entail paraconsistent consequences, being committed to a particular pre-consistent logic or a pre-consistent mechanism, they could also show that uh, the reasoning that was uh, rolling all these scientific processes was very much classical. They are just called pre-consistent, I, I don't know, maybe the spirit. But um, so it consists of a set of strategies or general procedures that are explanatory of the way in which it's possible to handle contradictions in order to avoid explosion. Such strategies are very consistent in the sense that they allow scientists to avoid logical explosion in an optimal way, recognizing that what is optimal would depend on um, the own constraints of each of the cases that are being studied. Pre-consistent reasoning strategies do not necessarily focus on the structure of the scientific ecosystem theory or model itself, but they, pass they pay a special attention to what? The information uh, that epistemic agents often employ to identify the contradiction and the ways in which agents use information in scientific problem solving and still avoid triviality. This minimal approach to inconsistent scientific reasoning was first sketched through pressure and manner mechanisms. And one can see that, um, like the subsequent uh, exemplars in things such as chunk and permeate. But if one looks at the philosophical part of the discussions uh, in these papers of chunk and permeate, which I think are four papers uh, from Brown and Priest, what one can see, three papers from Brown and Priest, uh, what one can see is that the philosophy behind that, the philosophical motivation and the methodological guidance is more general than only chunk and permeate. This is chunk and permeate is a pretty consistent reason and strategy that will uh, push you to just chunk the information once you see like the theory is inconsistent, chunk it in consistent chunks and uh, allow 
some information to permeate from one chunk to another in order to um, avoid triviality. So don't make contradictions go from one chunk to another or uh, close the chunks under different logical consequence relations and allow them, uh, as some of them, if you want to be prior consistent and so on. So the basic idea is that for chunk permeate, you will assign the logic, the logical consequence relation uh, to close the chunks of information according to the historical evidence that you have. Uh, they are not giving you any like prior guidance on that, but the only guidance that chunk and permeate provides is to chunk and to allow the permeation of information. But we can say uh, that similar mechanisms can be found in the methodological and formal resources that we already have. For instance, if one considers very broadly things such as partial structures, one can say that uh, partial structures do not necessarily privilege any particular uh, logic, but they allow you to explain how information was moved, how information was trusted, under which circumstances. And then you might uh, commit to, to a certain logic in the case, but the, the strategy, the methodological strategy that a uh, partial structure would provide is broadly uh, and more general than the ones that the logical approaches allegedly did. So uh, as, as I said, we can find instances of this in the pressure and manner mechanisms. We can find instances of this in the different uh, instances of chunk and permeate. Also in methodological formal resources such as partial structures. And maybe we can see uh, that there is a close connection between adaptive logics and the way they are constructed or they are built. And this is spirit of the uh, alternative for a consistent or formal approach. So uh, would that work? I, I would expect that uh, this these strategies or these formal tools will help us to better model and explain how uh, was the inconsistency toleration uh, carried out in a specific uh, cases and will allow us to accommodate more historical information, more epistemological reports that we have, uh, for instance, about the toxastic commitments that scientists had, the ones that they didn't have and so on, uh, because they have more room for, um, for constraining certain models and uh, being loose about others. Uh, but also uh, one would expect that the applicability, the success of the applicability of these strategies and the successful of the applicability of the algebra that would come out uh, from the models, for instance, from the models of Chunk and Permeate would um, enhance our uh, commitments towards that particular uh, that particular strategy and also the particular algebra that uh, that comes from the model uh, that is can be uh, can be described through the model in in the cases of ap applying this uh, prism strategies or these pre consistent uh, alternative approaches and so uh, in general what they have said is that uh, if we focus on the role of applicability uh, and we count it as evidence uh, in favor of a particular type of logic, in this case, paraconsistent logics, then we have to be uh, more demanding, at least at the methodological level, about the way in which this evidence is constructed. And so if we have the problems that uh, have been suggested by the literature in the cases of this adaptive leap and this historical accuracy, inaccuracy that people like Peter Vickers or Kevin Davy had uh, argued against the formal approaches of preconsistency in the sciences, uh, this, this evidence that we get might not work as evidence in favor of anything. Nor our scientific, uh, nor our philosophical theory about the scientific practice of inconsistency toleration, neither about the um, the role that certain logics might play in the sciences or in the scientific reasoning, at least. And so, considering that the abductive lead problem and the uh, and the sources of this problem, one can take at least two formal approaches: the traditional one, which is just take a pre-consistent logic and try to find applications for it. Or build, in a sense, build new, uh, new logics or discover if any of these logics is privileged by taking the alternative approach, which consists only on following certain inference patterns and, and from that generating other uh, logical constraints. 
And um, so some open questions that might result from this is that we have to explain the status of the models that are constructed via uh, this alternative approach. For instance, as I was saying, what happens with the models or the algebra that underlies the models of chunk and in, in each particular case? Should we be committed to that algebra as a logic uh, because it, it is explanatory of certain cases or of a particular case? Or should we just take it uh, as a good tool for explaining and understanding uh, what is going on in these cases? Um, also, what happens with the debate about logical pluralism and this evidence that we can construct via this alternative approach and if how this has or doesn't have any effect in the debate of anti-exceptionalist and anti-exceptionalist about logic. Uh, in the sense of building and providing evidence in favor of a particular logic or a particular uh, logical tool. And that might be it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Yep. Thank you, thank you. So questions, who wants to ask questions? Okay, Otavio, please. Thanks, Maria. This was a very rich and interesting talk. I appreciate. Um, Thank you, Tavi. I'm, I'm very sympathetic, of course, with uh, your overall, overall As soon life. as I said partial structures. <laughs> so, and um, no, even, obviously, even beyond that. And, um, and I, I do think also, in, in particular, your criticism of the kind of abductive uh, mm -hmm. approach to try to justify uh, the use of some kind of consistency is uh, troublesome. Um, but let me just play the devil's advocate for a second on, on that score, because someone may say the following and say, okay, granted, we, we don't need abduction to, uh, to implement um, the, the use of, of a very consistent logic. Um, let's just notice the following fact, right? that there are inconsistencies in a certain uh, domain uh, of inquiry. Um, they are recognized as such and that people do not infer everything out of them, right? Is an indication that some paraconsistent logic is used. Uh, now, to block that move, someone may use um, the kind of change of view uh, approach that you mentioned, uh, Harman's, uh, uh, that detach logic and reasoning, right? And say, no, no, logic is one thing, reason is in another. Um, you're not obliged, logic doesn't oblige you to do anything. You have to decide which principles you're gonna apply. And it's just, just don't apply the principles, right? So in face of cons inconsistencies. And it seems to me that that's a terrible, absolutely undefensible view, right? Uh, in large part because it doesn't matter whether you apply or not the principles, right? If uh, you have an inconsistent, then if your logic is classical, uh, all the con everything will follow, whether you bother to do the implications or not, right? So I think that's just a terrible confusion on his part. And, uh, and it, look, you can only get that from someone who is not a logician, right? That's the kind of response that I think just flies on the face of what logic is and what it matters. Um, so I'm gonna ignore that as a non-starter uh, to, uh, to, to the response uh, and return to the original trouble, right? So, because in effect, once we have the inconsistency uh, in a given domain, uh, once it's acknowledged, yes, we do have here an inconsistency and once no triviality results, right? People don't start drawing all kinds of inferences. It seems to me that there is no other way uh, if no bits of information are uh, 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 rejected to block the inconsistency, some logic has to be paraconsistent. So that, I, uh, and that seems to me un, uh, undeniable here. Uh, it's not clear which paraconsistent logic, but some has to be. Now note that there is no abductive inference going on here, right? This is just a point about applied logic, right? And, uh, and so we don't need an abductive inference here to say 
in this case, it looks like some, the underlying logic has to be some paraconsistent logic or other. So what, so what would you respond? I, I get the impression that people uh, like Peter Beakers and uh, these supporters of the content uh, guidance approach will claim that it's not the work of the logic, but it's the work of something else. For instance, the exhaustive commitments, what you are doing is just weakening your commitments and that allow you to uh, not use certain part of the contradiction in, in the processes that you are following, for instance, in the proofs that you are constructing and things like that. And it's not necessarily to change the logic, what is happening, but is that classical logic is being guided by this new epistemological insights or uh, this new content precisions that, that they have made. And so one has to explain how that doesn't uh, rule out, for instance, the cases of in which paraconsistent logics or at least paraconsistent uh, inference patterns are behind scientific reasoning, right? So, and in order to do something like that, I, I think the only option is to go from analyzing the inference patterns that are ruling this inconsistent fragment of either the proof or the reasoning in general or the explanation. And only after analyzing them, one will get this ex alternative explanations of, oh, okay, they had this consistency preservation mechanisms uh, or they had this paraconsistency um, tolerant mechanisms behind them. And only after that, you can say what happens with the logic. But if... Yeah, yeah. But, but not one, one thing, because uh, the assumption I was making was, uh, it's part of the problem here that once faced with a contradiction, you're not trying to rule out some bits of bits, bits and pieces of inference. Yeah. Now, the moment that the move is you say, oh, look, uh, we are not that committed with this portion of the theory. So I'm going to leave that out. Uh, even if that's pragma on pragmatic grounds, or even if that's just temporally, um, this is, of course, you can reconcile that with classical logic. But that means at that point, you just decide to rule out some bits of inference. And the question is, do you have good reasons to do that? And how can you do that, right? That's exactly at that point uh, is, uh, where I think the paraconsistent logician is say, look, you can't, right? Um, you're just arbitrarily ruling out some bits of inference. How do you know that that's the part uh, that's responsible, right? Um, and, and if you don't, uh, in order to reason through, given the inconsistency, you need some paraconsistent logic to be able then to gather some better information uh, and assess perhaps which bits and pieces of the relevant theory should indeed be rejected. Um, so the, my assumption was, look, if you are, if you are to take seriously that we are not just going to a priori rule out some bits of inference to apply classical logic, then mm -hmm. you have to use some paraconsistent logic. Yeah, I, I mean, I am I am very sympathetic to to that uh, to that spirit, especially if you take cases such as the um, Newtonian early calculus, right? Because people say, oh, Newton never committed to uh, infinitesimals to be really inconsistent, but apparently the inferential practice at the time was inconsistency tolerant in some senses. So we have to say something about the logic that prevented uh, the proofs to be trivial in, in that sense. Uh, but what, I, what I, um, I am advocating for is to not only incorporate that intuition into our analysis, but also the, the alternative explanations that even the scientists are providing. For instance, these explanations that Newton provided. And so only after combining all these two, we can say something about which, which was the type of logic that underlied this reasoning. So yes, I agree that uh, the option of having a pre consistent logic in the background uh, shouldn't be ruled out. But we have to find a way to incorporate, to better incorporate the evidence, the historical evidence and the uh, reports that we have from the scientists and the reports that we have from the practices and so on. And so the traditional approaches, I, I think they are not strong enough for doing something like that, or they are not flexible enough. Yeah, I fully agree with that. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Octavio. Peter, please, you can talk. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I have two questions, uh, two remarks. Uh, first, uh, anti-exceptionalism. Uh, Quine may call it metaphilo metaphilosophical gradualism may have consequences for the a priori, a posteriori distinction. Do you agree on this? And what do you think about Francis Kripke's a posteriori necessities, like the evening star is the morning star and water is uh, H2O? And then a uh, second question, is abduction a common philosophical methodology next to deduction and induction uh, based on Sherlock Holmes? That's the only uh, place I know uh, deduction abduction abduction from uh, so um i i am i am not sure i have um any standpoint to defend um regarding the first question but the second one uh, one one may wonder why are we rejecting this abductive a step from going to there is a contradiction there is no triviality involved uh there must be an underlying a consistent logic there must be a pre consistent logic underlying this scientific reasoning part of something like that and so we might question that because we say abduction seems to be very successful in our scientific and philosophical enterprise so if we want to explain what is happening here uh, abduction is a good inferential mechanism to arrive at least at a possible explanation of why scientists did not entail everything or uh from from this from this proof, from this model, from this theory, and so on. Uh, is, is abduction indeed uh, based on the example of Sherlock Holmes? Uh, is that abduction you're talking about, or maybe another type of? No, uh, well, is 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 that is that sense of abduction to to provide uh, the best explanation that we have at hand? But mm -hmm. in the case of Sherlock Holmes, it seems that uh, in the majority of stories that we can find. He was providing the best explanation that that he mm. had at hand, but mm. in this case, it's not so clear how this is the best one because we don't have uh, enough evidential support for it for the conclusion, which is that there is a very consistent logic behind uh, these fragments of scientific reasoning. So, uh, like, the thing that I am suggesting is that we better find. Be best or stronger or more robust exp um, evidence in favor of this. We gather the more uh, reports that we have, the more uh, evidential uh, elements that we can. And once we have them, then we might be able to uh, make an abductive move, but only after that and not mm -hmm. in the same way in which it has been done, uh, for instance, in this uh, traditional view. And with regard to the first question, uh, do you know uh, Quine's metaphilosophical gradualism? Do you think it's uh, consistent with anti-exceptionalism? Uh, I, I, I think it metaphilosophical gradualism. He also says that logic and science are uh, in uh, are um, continuing each other. Yeah. Well, uh, Quine. Quine is uh, the first, I think, the first anti-exceptionalist in, in the yeah. story. Also but, uh, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be able to say more about that. But, but, but it may have consequences, of course, for a distinction uh, between a priori and a posteriori. But, but that, that's why I said yeah. I have no, no commitments on that part of the discussion, because what I think I am using anti-exceptionalist, uh, the anti-exceptionalist standpoint for is just to justify and explain why certain inquiries in philosophical logic and philosophy of science are worth pursuing and which is going to be the value of the outcome. Uh, but mm. I, I wouldn't be able to say anything else about like the general or the um, future philosophical value of, of these enterprises. So. And, uh, and a posteriori necessities, like uh, water is H2O. What do you think of this uh, theory, this chemical physical theory, water is H2O? Is that improving on the existing theories? Uh, uh, well, I think... <laughs> um, what, what I think is that, for instance, in this case, we will not get something like that. We will not get something like which is the underlying logic of ra of human rationality, for instance. If we run this uh, 
these procedures, these methodological um, paths that I have suggested, uh, even if there is an anti-exceptionalist spirit behind them, uh, the results that we will have will not be like a posteriori necessities about uh, human reasoning or uh, logical consequence relations closing parts of scientific uh, reasoning or scientific theories and so on. So uh, I, I just think this, this will not get there. Okay, okay, thanks for the thank replies. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Andres. Mm. Hola, Andres. ¿Qué tal, María? ¿Cómo estás? Muchas gracias por tu charla. Uh, well, I think it was quite interesting, and your approach is very global, and so it's many features, and I think it's quite interesting to, to have a, some kind of <laughs> critical view about the view about paraconsistency, <laughs> and I think it's quite interesting to have that level that we can be now at that level and put that together with other possibilities. I just want to ask you one thing. We can think about a paraconsistent reconstruction. And you say, go back to infinitesimal calculus, they say there were inconsistencies there and they were not mm -hmm. acknowledging, you mentioned with Newton. And that's quite interesting because we say, well, these people were having inconsistency in drawing conclusions. So as Otavio maybe said, well, they, they have to have some kind of paraconsistent logic, but we know they didn't have paraconsistent logic. So you can say, well, they have a, some kind of paraconsistent attitude that will say they have inconsistencies, but don't draw any conclusion about that. And that is a paraconsistent attitude, but not a paraconsistent logic. And then you would, let me point to what you say. You say, well, that attitude not necessarily leads us to a, a logic, because maybe the people have that attitude, but didn't have the, the, the logic. And your point is quite interesting. Maybe the people don't follow that idea of the prescriptive character of logic. And so how they don't care about the logic and keep on doing what they are doing. So what, what I want to ask you is maybe paraconsistent reconstruction is there, is a uh, possibility to say, well, you could have seen that in that way, but somehow historically there is no many cases of scientists saying, yes, I'm inconsistent, I'm so happy with that. We, ha we have the famous poet that says, uh, the, the American poet, of course, I am consistent. I, I have a lot of Adam, the famous poet of grass, the leaves of grass. I, well, Whitman, well, Whitman. <laughs> he says, uh, yes, of course, I am consistent. I, I embrace a multitude, uh, many people inside of me. But in science, we all don't have that because there is like a saying, well, if you're inconsistent, you're wrong, go out, unless you were in like a uh, dialectical mood or whatever. So. What I want to ask you is, we, we have that possibility of reconstructing paraconsistently going, going back, backwards. That your proposal is to say, well, it's not always the case. Maybe we have to have a case of reconstructing things in a way that people have a more close and not allowing this global view that the people are like us who are concerned about logic. We like the global view, say, how well. What do you think about rationality itself? Maybe the people they were not concerned about that. That's it. Th thank you, Andres. I, th I think um, I think your question allows me to relate my talk to Jonas's, and, and the reason is, um, well, we can. Uh, I find this projects like really worth to pursue such as Chanka Bermiate. The initial Chanka Bermiate project was to provide uh, logical reconstructions, but not historical reconstructions of the case studies, only to illustrate how certain paraconsistent moves could be uh, could be useful when, handi when handling inconsistent information. But the type of evidence or the degree uh, the evidential degree that this reconstruction had is very different from the ones that the more historically accurate will have, right? And that's the reason why I have these anti-exceptionalist uh, assumptions behind. Because what I think is happening around here is that when logicians are providing applications of the logic, in particular cases of inconsistency in science, what they are aiming to do is not only to be able to explain how this, uh, this might have been addressed by, uh, by a particular paraconsistent logic, but they are saying that there is certain justification 
for that logic coming from the historical record. And what I think that it's not happening is that uh, they are doing the like the full job. So if they if they do not look at the historical record in the detail that it should be uh, be looked at, and if they do not inform the reconstructions with all the evidence that they might have at hand, then the evidential support that this reconstruction provides in favor of a particular paraconsistent logic or any logic is not going to be like really evidential support. Maybe it will be a toy example, it will be something that enhances our understanding of the strategy, but not our understanding of uh, paraconsistent reasoning in these cases or paraconsistent reasoning in science in general. So that I think these projects are worth pursuing, but uh, the results is much weaker than the result that we could achieve uh, moving a bit in our methodology. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Itala, please. Hi, Itala. Hi, Maria. Many thanks for the talk. I like it very much. Uh, my claim uh, would be in the direction of Andres' claim. But first, I would like to say that I agree with Otavio, for sure. And uh, to me, it seems that the question is the logic underlying the process is para consistent. This is the question. Even if the scientist or uh, the historian uh, don't know or don't observe that, there is a process which logic underlying it uh, is para consistent. And this was one of the most important intuitions presented by Newton da Costa in his first papers concerning inconsistent but non-trivial systems. And your example is excellent when you mentioned, when you have mentioned Newtonian's uh, classical differential calculus. Uh, since the introduction of the calculus, there were several criticisms. We could recall Berkeley's very famous uh, work, The Analyst, where he claimed against the inconsistencies inherent to the of Newton's paper. But, uh, mm -hmm. and, but during, you, you are correct, during two centuries, the area, the analysis, the differential calculus developed, but there was a, a problem with the inconsistency inherent to the concept of infinitesimal. The problem seemed to be uh, solved when Weierstrass, at the end of the 19th, 19th century, presented his definition of limit. Cauchy tried it a little before, during the 19th century, but he couldn't. The, uh, several problems I have, I, I, I have not to mention this, but Weierstrass presented a good definition, accepted by mathematicians. But this, uh, def his definition by using epsilons and deltas is not sufficient. And it's not, so, not sufficient that we had to wait for Robinson's non-standard analysis, solving the problem by using model theory and a and, and non-first order logic, and non-first order language. But Newton da Costa proposed his solution by using a, for a consistent differential calculus that is very interesting. And this, his calculus extends not only Newtonian calculus, but also non-standard analysis. And by using this paraconsistent calculus, there is no problem with the inconsistency inherent to the concept of infinitesimal. And so we have a paraconsistent solution, but we have in the historical process, from my point of view, the way how science develops a paraconsistent underlying logic, very according to Persis, Charles Persis, pragmatistic. Uh, 
approach, I think. But this doesn't uh, invalidate your position. I think it, I, I consider it is very interesting, but I like to think so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. No, I think I really like this example because uh, it has been reconstructed from very different standpoints in the same paraconsistent tradition. So uh, if, if one looks, for instance, at the, ca at the case of uh, Chunga Bermier, the first paper of Chunga Bermier, one of the first claims that uh, they they make in, in the introduction is that they are not providing a historical reconstruction. They are only providing an alternative explanation of how the, the inferential procedures might have been carried out. And so when one looks in contrast to uh, Peter Beaker's book in the chapter about Newtonian early calculus, what he is saying is uh, regardless how, how these inferential procedures were carried out or how proofs were really constructed, uh, what matters is the explanations that Newton were providing, uh, for instance, to Berkeley and some others about which were the, the characterizations of infinitesimals, for instance, whether they were inconsistent or they were not, and if it, the proof the, the proof was uh, constructing being constructed inconsistently only as a shortcut for getting good results in less time or uh, in a more handy way, and. And what I think is that, uh, well, what projects are interesting and the results are interesting, if we want to achieve a certain type of understanding of what's happening in, in the reasoning, we have to incorporate these two, these two things. So if we can reconstruct the, the formal uh, strategies that help us to get certain proofs solved, that is not enough. We have because we know that reasoning is also informed and permeated by the things that we believe and the things that we don't believe about about what we are using. So we have to integrate both stories, and uh, and yeah, and and I I would like to see uh, Newton's Newton's theory, like the calculus theory, very consistent calculus theory. Can you send me something? Thank you. Please send it to me to Itala. Sorry? If you can send that paper to me too, okay. I would be grateful. I have new to well, I'm, going, I'm going to send you all an email at the end, like okay. tomorrow, and maybe there okay. we can share some materials. Okay, Jonas wants to ask you a question, Maria. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Very nice. I will be very quick. And it's a follow-up to, to Andre's question uh, about the reconstruction. And I would like to know very briefly your thoughts on the idea that we could avoid this kind of problem on whether the logic on science is paraconsistent or not. If we follow some remarks, for instance, by Newton and other people, Newton da Costa uh, and not the other Newton, uh, that there is no well-defined logic in, in natural language. And basically what people are doing are different reconstructions. So uh, they're not really rival, but uh, complementary approaches. And perhaps the anti-exceptionalist uh, focuses too much on this point on the dispute about the right logic. And this kind of thing could be avoided with uh, this approach of uh, not really attaching uh, natural language to uh, specific logic. So basically, I would like to know your thoughts on that, because I'm uh, sympathetic to that view. I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that um, that there is not uh, an underlying logic in in science. But the, I think what happens is that in the majority of cases in which we have uh, instances of inconsistency toleration in the sciences, and that logicians have focus on them, uh, what is happening is that there is a part a quite a specific part of the reasoning that in, involves inferential procedures and uh, not entailing everything. And so if we want to explain what is happening there, as there are inferential procedures, we have to say something about the logic. Uh, and this doesn't imply that we have uh, to hold, sorry for the noise, any, any commitments about uh, logic in general, logic in the sciences in general, logic in human reasoning in general. 
but only for these chunks of uh, of practices or uh, or explanations or proofs that scientists are are providing. And if we want to explain what's happening there, we have to uh, to say something about that logic, but we also have to say something about other components of human reasoning, and and that's that's my thought. May I say something very little? Some of us have defended the difference between paraconsistency and paraconsistent logic. Yep. And saying paraconsistency is a wider problem than paraconsistent logic. Always obviously related and very base historical that paraconsistency is more a wider problem. So, yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree to that. And you can say that uh, the spirit behind the inconsistency toleration is paraconsistent in that sense. But uh, still, uh, that's that's why I am interested in the anti-exceptionalist exceptionalist debate about logic because they seem to to be getting from these historical cases uh, privileged evidence in favor of of logics, not only of paraconsistence in general, but of paraconsistent logic. So, uh, but uh, still, the spirit can be paraconsistent in in the weaker sense, in the sense that it motivates the toleration, at least temporary toleration of contradictions. Yep. Can I just make one comment about Andres' comments? Oh, uh, yes, but on one condition, <laughs> you continue with your talk. Okay. It's, it's your talk, so. <laughs> yeah. no, so um, it's your I, talk is about to finish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'll, read, I'll read the title of my my talk, and then we open for discussion. So, <laughs> so um, no, I think Andrea is right. Of course, there is a distinction between paraconsistency and paraconsistent logic. And, um, and of course, he argues for that in his, in his book. Itala, Itala, in her own book, uh, also uh, makes, uh, provides a history of paraconsistency through centuries, well before paraconsistent logic was conceived as a logic. And so I think it makes sense. However, I would like to make a Kantian point. It seems to me that paraconsistency without paraconsistent logic is empty. And paraconsistent logic without paraconsistency is blind, right? So you should is, register <laughs> that statement. <laughs> we need both. <laughs> and I think that's what, what Newton's, uh, Newton da Costa's work was so important because he brought the two things together in a systematic, coherent and articulated way. Uh, it's only at that point that, in a way, paraconsistency actually becomes a relevant real alternative. Because without the, the logic, uh, it's just an idea, right? Oh, let's all embrace, con you know, con uh, admit contradictions and so on. Okay, yes, how do we do that? <laughs> right, that's where, where oh, paraconsistency Now you became a Leibnizian and Newton da Costa is so important because he presented para consistency in a series of logical papers from a syntactical and semantical point of view. That is mm -hmm. what we want in, in logic. Yeah, I agree. Before. All right. Okay. Okay. My comment is done. <laughs>